he had seen them light up when his cousin had unexpectedly entered a room where she was sitting. No, he did not think that if anything had gone amiss with the marriage, it arose from any lack of affection. He recollected having heard it said that in love matches, even more than in marriages of convenience, the first year was often one of tiffs and misunderstandings, and decided that so much profound cogitation was leading him to refine too much upon the couple's public conduct. But if there had been disagreements, Mr. Heatherset, knowing just how formidable his cousin could be when he was angered, could readily understand the reluctance of his very young bride to confide her sins to him. It would be useless to press her to do so, he thought. But having reached this conclusion, he found himself at a stand, for there was no one other than herself who could tell Cardros of the fix she was in without setting up his back. But just as he was about to leave the hazard room, Dysart, who had been too deeply concerned with the fall of the dice to notice his entrance, happened to look up and to see him. He called a careless greeting, and on the instant Mr. Heatherset was smitten by his idea. If he could be persuaded to do it, Dysart was the one person who could tell Cardross, unexceptionably, even perhaps with advantage, the truth. Mr. Heatherset had no doubt at all that Nell's debts had been incurred on his behalf, and very little that a frank confession made by him of the whole would win a plenary absolution for Nell, and in all probability pecuniary assistance for himself. It would be an easy matter for him to convince Cardross that Nell had yielded only to his urgent entreaties, and Cardross would be swift to recognize and to appreciate the courage that enabled him to perform so unpleasant a duty. Only did he possess that courage. Mr. Heatherset, joining the scattering of lookers-on gathered round the table, glanced speculatively at him, considering the matter. Physical courage he certainly possessed to a pronounced degree, but in spite of taking a perverse pride in being thought a care for nobody, he had not as yet given any one reason to suppose that he had any strength of moral character. Mr. Heatherset, several years his senior, and a man of a different kidney, was not one of his friends, and even less one of his admirers but he did them the justice to acknowledge that although he knew he was a resty young blade, decidedly loose in the haft, incorrigibly spendthrift, and ready at any moment to plunge into whatever extravagant folly was suggested to him by his impish fancy, he had never been known, even in his most reckless mood, to step over the line that lay between the venial peccadilloes of a wild youth and such questionable exploits as must bring his name into dishonour. He was both generous and good-natured, and Mr. Heatherset rather thought that he held his sister in considerable affection. He knew, too, that Cardross, better acquainted with him, and increasingly exasperated by his starts, by no means despaired of him. Without going to the length of forecasting for him a future distinguished by sobriety or solvency, he said that if a cornetcy could be but provided for him, he would find an outlet for his restless energy, and might do tolerably well. "'He may be a scamp,' said Cardross, "'but there's no sham in him, nothing of the dry boots. It would give me a great deal of pleasure to go sharply to work with him, but he's plucked to the backbone, and I own I like that.' Mr. Heatherset had a great respect for his cousin's judgment, and remembering these words, he made up his mind to have at least a touch at Dysart. Since the task was not one he looked forward to with relish, he thought that the sooner it was accomplished, the better it would be, and decided that unless Dysart arose from the table a loser, he would broach the matter that very day. From the flush in the Viscount's cheeks and the over-brightness of his eyes, he had at first glance supposed him to be a trifle foxed, but he soon realized that for once he had wronged him. The Viscount whose exuberance could lead him to become top-heavy at almost any hour of the day, was by far too keen a gamester to join a gaming table when in his altitudes. There was certainly a glass at his elbow, 
but the brandy it held sank hardly at all during the time Mr. Heatherset stood watching the play, and from time to time making his bet on the odds monotonously declared by the groom porter. The table broke up at a comparatively early hour, even the Viscount agreeing, after a series of throw-ups, that the game had become languid and boring. He did not rise a loser, but his winnings were not large. However, when one of the company joked him about his uncertain luck, saying that he would be obliged to go back to Pharaoh after all, he replied cheerfully that only a muttonhead could have been blind to the signs of reviving fortune that night. Not a vowel of mine on the table, he said. And I'll put some forty guineas in your purse, added Mr. Fancourt encouragingly. To my mind, that clinches it, Dye. Stick to the bones. Yes, I think I shall, agreed Dysart. Dashed if I won't try my luck at this new house Jack was talking to me about. I remember my father's telling me once that he often found it answered to shift one's ground. Lord Pevensey's notorious unsuccess as a gamester notwithstanding, everyone except Mr. Heatherset thought that the Viscount could hardly do better than follow his advice. Only one slightly muddled gentleman demurring that no one should play at a hell who was not up to the sharps. But as he became hopelessly incoherent in his subsequent attempt to illustrate this remark by recounting the sad history of a flat who went from a nibble at a club to a dead hit at a hell, no one paid any heed to him. The morning light was faintly illumining the scene when the party dispersed on the steps of the club. Mr. Heatherset, who knew that it might be days before he again found the opportunity to approach Dysart, considerably surprised him by suggesting that they should bear one another company on the way to their respective lodgings. Duke Street, isn't it? he said. Take a look in at my place and play off your dust. All on our way, and the night's young yet. Dysart looked at him, suspecting him of being slightly mellow. He showed no sign of it, but Dysart, perfectly well aware of his disapprobation, could think of no other reason to account for his sudden friendliness. Before he had had time to answer him, Mr. Fancott, who lived in St. James's Square and had sent the porter out to procure a hackney, generously offered to take both him and Mr. Heatherset up and to set them down again at their lodgings. "'Very much obliged to you.' responded Mr. Heatherset, a shade of annoyance in his face. I think I'll walk, however. Devilish stuffy in the club tonight. Need a breath of air. He met the Viscount's alert, speculative gaze, and said curtly, Got something to tell you. Have you, though? said Dysart, considerably intrigued. I'll go along with you, then. They left the club together but were overtaken almost immediately by a gregarious gentleman who fell into step with them, saying chattily that since his destination was in King Street, he would walk with them. His company was accepted cheerfully by Dysart, and by Mr. Heatherset, who foresaw that he would be difficult to shake off, with resignation. It would be a hard task to avoid the necessity of including him in his invitation to Dysart, but he was determined to do it however much it went against the grain with him to appear inhospitable. He managed to perform this feat at the cost of standing patiently at the corner of Ryder Street in St. James's, while the Viscount and Mr. Wittering maintained for twenty minutes an argument which had been started before the party had crossed over to the south side of Piccadilly. It was pursued with considerable animation, and it afforded Mr. Heatherset mildly contributing his might whenever he was granted the opportunity, with a novel view of the Viscount. The victory of Bonaparte at Lützen over General Wittgenstein, commanding the combined forces of Russia and Prussia, had not long been known in London and was still being much discussed. Shaking his head over the disaster, Mr. Wittering expressed the opinion that there was no doing anything against Boney, and never would be. Since this pessimism was shared by many, 
such remarks having been heard for years past at any social gathering, Mr. Heatherset did not think it worth while to reply. It was otherwise with the Viscount. He was ready to agree that none of the foreign generals could have the smallest hope of defeating Boney, but he recommended Mr. Wittering to wait and see how quickly Wellington would knock him into flinders. Mr. Wittering said disparagingly that a victory or two in Spain made no odds. The Viscount instantly offered to bet a monkey that the English army would be over the Pyrenees before the year was out, and the argument rapidly became heated. Mr. Wittering, no supporter of the Wellesleys, was unwise enough to say that Wellington's victories had been exaggerated and within a very few minutes was not only being dragged relentlessly through the previous year's campaigns, but was being given a lesson in strategy into the bargain. To Mr. Heatherset's surprise, the Viscount, whom he had always supposed to be perfectly feather-headed, not only appeared to be passionately interested in the subject, but had very obviously studied it with some thoroughness. Mr. Wittering, on the retreat, acknowledged that Wellington was a good defensive general, but added that he was too cautious and had no brilliance in attack. "'No brilliance in attack?' demanded the Viscount. "'After Salamanca?' "'Well, I, I, I don't know about Salamanca,' said Mr. Wittering unguardedly. "'All I say is—' But the Viscount cut him short. Mr. Heatherset, standing in patient boredom while armies manoeuvred about him, and the Viscount drew invisible lines on the flagway with the point of his cane, reflected that it would henceforward be impossible for Mr. Wittering to say, if there was any truth in him, that he didn't know about Salamanca. When Dysart, passing from the general to the particular, spoke of Le Marchand's charge, he did so with so much enthusiasm that Mr. Heatherset was moved to say that he seemed to know as much about it as if he had taken part in it. "'By Jove, don't I wish I had!' Dysart said impulsively. "'Well,' said Mr. Wittering, preparing to take his leave, "'what you ought to do, Di, is, is to, to, to join. I shouldn't wonder at it if you got to be a general. You go and tell old Hook knows what you want him to do.' There's no saying but what it might make him break up from cantonments before the summer's over. With this Parthian shot, he went off down the street, leaving the Viscount to explain to Mr. Heatherset that the lack of news from Wellington's headquarters undoubtedly presaged some brilliant move, probably in an unexpected direction. Everyone thinks he means to march on Madrid again, but you mark my words if he don't strike north. He's kept his plans mighty dark this time, but I've been talking to a cousin of mine. You know my cousin Lionel? Mr. Heatherset believed he had not had that pleasure. Been serving on one of our frigates, said the Viscount. Sent home a month ago on sick furlough. Plain as a pike staff, all those fellows have been warned to keep their mummers dubbed. But one thing he did let slip. We'd been landing stores along the northern coast. You can say that for that gorilla fellow longer, if you choose, but it don't look like it to me. No need to keep the thing so dark, if that's all it is. Mr. Heatherset did not avail himself of this permission, but said instead, glancing curiously up at his tall companion's profile, Why don't you join? Oh, I don't know, replied Dysart, with a return to his customary insouciance. I rather thought I should like to at one time, but I dare say I shouldn't. Anyway, my father won't hear of it. Mr. Heatherset did not pursue the matter. He could only be thankful that his question seemed to have cast a damper over the Viscount's desire to fight past battles again. They had by this time reached his lodging. He ushered his guest into the comfortable parlour he had rented on the entrance floor of the house, begged him to take a chair, and produced from a large sideboard a bottle of smuggled French cognac. "'Eye water?' he inquired. "'Mix your full as earth, if you like it better. I've got a pretty tolerable Madeira here.' The Viscount said he would take a drop of eye water. He watched Mr. Heatherset pour some of the cognac into two heavy glasses, 
and remarked with engaging frankness that he was damned if he knew what Mr. Heather said wanted with him. Thought at first you must be a bit on the go, but you don't seem to be, he said. Mr. Heather said handed him one of the glasses. Got something to tell you, he replied briefly. You haven't had a tip for the Chester races, have you? asked Dysart, hopefully. No, nothing like that. Mr. Heatherset took a fortifying sip of brandy. Awkward sort of business. Been teasing me all day. It sounds to me like a dashed heavy cavey business, said Dysart, eyeing him in astonishment. No, it ain't exactly that, though I don't mind telling you, I'd as leave not break it to you, said Mr. Heatherset, who was finding his self-imposed task even more difficult to accomplish than he had foreseen. Good God! You ain't going to tell me you've been set on to tell me my father slipped his wind, exclaimed Dysart, sitting up with a jerk. Now, of course I haven't, said Mr. Heatherset, irritated. Is it likely that I'd be the man to break that sort of news to you? No, but if it comes to that, you ain't the sort of man to invite me at half past four in the morning either, retorted Dysart. It's no use banning me you've got a sudden fancy for my company, or I know dashed well you haven't. Never said anything of the sort. No objection to your company, mind, but it wasn't that I wanted. The thing is, it's a deuced delicate matter. Well, I can't guess what the devil it can be, but there's no need to skirt around it, said Dysart encouragingly. In fact, I'd leave you cut line. I can stand a knock or two. Mr. Heather said, tossed off the rest of his brandy in his glass. Concerns your sister, he said. The Viscount stared at him. Concerns my sister, he repeated. What the devil? Didn't think you'd like it, said Mr. Heatherset, with a gloomy satisfaction in the accuracy of his prognostication. Don't like it myself. You know George Burnley? What? thundered the Viscount, setting his own glass down with such a violence that he nearly broke it. Mr. Heatherset winced and protested. No need to bellow at me. No need to... What has that ginger-hackled court card to do with my sister? demanded the Viscount, a very dangerous light in his eyes. Hasn't anything to do with her, replied Mr. Heatherset, faintly surprised. What's more, though I don't say he ain't ginger-hackled, he ain't a court card. Friend of mine. Dashed if I know why you should get into a myth just because you're asked if you're acquainted with him. You said it concerned my sister, Cardross. Didn't say anything of the kind. At least not about poor George. And if you weren't the biggest gudgeon on the town, you'd know I wouldn't have said a word about it if he had been concerned with her, he added severely. Well, what has Burnley to do with it? asked the Viscount, mollified but impatient. Gave him a look in this morning. He lives in Clarges Street. Yes, I know he does. And if that's all he wanted to tell me, got a house opposite Jew King's, said Mr. Heatherset, contemplating his elegant snuff-box with rapt attention. There was a momentary silence. Go on, said Dysart grimly. Mr. Heatherset glanced up at him. Well, that's it, he said apologetically. Saw Lady Cardross. Recognised her bonnet. Heavily veiled. No need to fear George knew her. Are you saying she went into Jew King's place? No. Meant to, but I stopped her. I'm very much obliged to you, then. Bird-witted little fool, said Dysart savagely. Don't have to be obliged to me. Got a great regard for her. Besides, related to Cardross, you know. Dashed well had to stop her. Seemed to be all in a pucker. Very anxious I shouldn't blab to Cardross. Well, stands to reason I shouldn't. No, my God, what did she tell you? Just said she wanted a temporary loan. Something she was devilish anxious Cardross shouldn't discover. Told her I wouldn't say a word to Giles if she promised to give up the notion of borrowing from a set per cent. So she did, but I ain't easy. Made up my mind the best thing to do was to tell you, Dysart. The Viscount nodded and got up. 
Much obliged to you, he said again. I'll give a pepper for this. I told her that was no way to raise the recruits. Damn me, I forbade her to, now I come to think of it. Promised her I'd see all tidy. Might have done it, too, if she hadn't taken a distempered freak into her head. And why she should be cast into high fidgets only because she's a trifle scorched, I'm damned if I know. Anyone would think Carlos was going to discover it tomorrow. Unless I've missed my tip, there's no reason why I should ever know a thing about it. But it's no use expecting me to raise the wind in a twinkling of an eye. But that's women all over. He turned to pick up his greatcoat. Mr. Heatherset watched him shrug himself into it. He was strongly tempted to let him go, but although he was not very hopeful of being able to prevail upon him to approach Cardross, he felt that it behoved him to make the attempt. "'Been thinking about it all day,' he said. "'Seems to me Cardross ought to know of it.' "'Well, he ain't going to,' replied Dysart shortly. "'Wouldn't do if he were to get wind of it,' insisted Mr. Heatherset. "'Wouldn't like it if he found her ladyship had been hoaxing him.' "'Now don't you start fretting and fuming,' begged Dysart. "'I told my sister I'd settle it, and so I will.' "'No business of mine, of course. "'But how?' asked Mr. Heatherset. "'By hedge or by style,' replied Dysart flippantly. "'It won't fadge. "'All to pieces yourself. "'They say you're thinking of a run of luck, "'but it ain't when one's run off one's legs that one gets the luck.' More likely to be physicked. Ever notice that it's pretty near always the best breech coves who win? Seems to me there's only one way you can help Lady Cardross. Dysart looked at him with a slight frown, creasing his brow. Well, what is it? Mr. Heatherset took snuff with deliberation. Best way out of the fix is for her to tell Cardross the help. Tried to get her to do it, but she wouldn't hear of it. Seemed to be in the deuce of a quake. No use telling her not the slightest need. Got the notion fixed in her head. I can't tell him. The best thing is for you to do it. I tell Cardross my sister swallowed a spider and is trying to break shins with Jew King, gasped the Viscount. Well, I thought she must be a trifle disguised when he asked me to come home with me, but I can see now that you're either ape drunk or touched in your upper works. No, I ain't, replied Mr. Heatherset stolidly. I know it's a dash difficult thing to do. In fact, it needs a devilish good bottom, but they say you've got that. Bottom? A damned whittling disposition is all I'd need, and I'll have you know that's something I've not got, Dysart shot at him. Cry rope on my own sister? By God, if I hadn't been drinking your brandy, damned if I wouldn't tip your settler, Heatherset. Mr. Heatherset was thrown into disorder. It was not that he particularly feared the Viscount's fists, both of which were suggestively clenched, but that, in face of that fiery young man's quick wrath, the horrid suspicion assailed him that he had been doing him an injustice. This was a breach of ton, the very thought of which made him turn pale. He hastened to make amends. "'Beg you won't give the brandy a thought,' he said. "'Not that I wish to sport a painted peeper, but I shouldn't like you to feel yourself at a disadvantage. Boot might be on the other leg, too. What I mean is, not a thing I'm partial to, but I can mill my way out of a row.' I should like to know what the devil you mean by thinking I'm the sort of rum tart who spoke under a misapprehension, said Mr. Heatherset. Took a notion into my head. Stupid thing to do. What notion? demanded the Viscount. Mr. Heatherset, much embarrassed, coughed. Upon the questions being repeated with a good deal of emphasis, he said, "'Couldn't think why Lady Cardross should be afraid to tell my cousin she was in debt. "'Very well acquainted with Cardross, you know, boys together. "'Ready to swear he'd give her anything she wanted. "'Might be in a tweak if she'd taken to gaming, but it can't be that. "'I mean, she don't know one card from the other. "'Occurred to me, perhaps it was something Cardross wouldn't allow.' "'He once more studied the design on his snuff-box. 
might even have forbidden it. Mind you, very understandable thing for her to do. Persuaded my cousin would think it so, too. Natural affection, I mean. Are you saying you thought she was under the hatches because she'd lent her blunt to me, demanded the Viscount. Only thing I got hit on, pleaded Mr. Heather said. See, I was mistaken, of course. The Viscount was just about to tell him extremely forcefully that so far from being responsible for Nell's difficulties, he had had nothing whatsoever to do with them, when he suddenly remembered his own obligation to her. It was true that this had not put her in debt at the time, but it was equally true that it had made it impossible for her to pay later for a Chantilly lace court dress. For a moment he felt abominably ill-used. She had assured him that she was flush in the pocket, and it was rather too bad of her subsequently to run into debt, instead of exercising a little economy. He eyed Mr. Heatherset smoulderingly. He had never liked this fellow above half, and to be unable to refute his ignoble suspicions made him seethe with rage. He wanted more than anything to plant him a facer, but since that also, under the circumstances, was impossible, he had to content himself with saying in a voice of ice, "'Accept my thanks for your kind offices, and rest assured that you have no need to tease yourself further in the matter. I wish you good night.' With these dignified words, he picked up his hat and cane, bowed stiffly to his host, and departed. Mr. Heatherset, closing the front door behind him, was left to mop his brow, and to wonder what would now be the outcome of the affair. Convinced of Dysard's innocence, he was still profoundly sceptical of his ability to rescue his sister from the river Tick. Chapter 7 Not very many hours later, Nell was surprised and gratified to receive a visit from her brother. She had been hopeful that he would call that day, but since his habits were by no means matutinal, she had had no expectation of seeing him until afternoon. She and Letty had returned to Grosvenor Square at eleven o'clock, after spending more than an hour walking in Hyde Park and the Viscount reached the house just as they were rising from the breakfast-table. He declined an offer of breakfast, saying that all he wanted was a word with his sister. From his tone, Nell was not encouraged to hope that he had hit upon a solution to her problem, and the look on his face warned her that something had happened to put him out of humour. Letty, with deplorable want of tact, informed him that he looked to be as cross as a cat and demanded to know the reason. He replied that he was not at all cross, but wished to be private with his sister. Since this could only be regarded as a heavy set-down, Letty instantly took umbrage, and a very spirited dialogue ensued, during the course of which several personalities of an uncomplimentary nature were exchanged. The Viscount emerged victorious from the engagement, taking unhandsome advantage of his greater years, and informing Letty, with all the air of a sexagenarian, that pertness was neither proper nor pleasing in chits of her age. Unable to think of anything crushing enough to say in reply, Letty flounced out of the room, slamming the door behind her. "'How could you die?' exclaimed Nell reproachfully. I never heard anything so uncivil. And if we are to talk of impropriety, you know it is quite improper for you to be scolding Letty. You are not her brother. No, and thank God for it, he returned. If she don't take care, she'll grow into one of those hurly-burly women there's no bearing. But, Di, why are you so out of reason cross? I'll tell you, he said awfully. And don't put on any innocent airs, my girl, because you can't gammon me or turn me up sweet by making sheep's eyes at me. 
You've been playing an under game, and well you know it. What the devil did you mean by going off to Jew King after I'd told you I wouldn't have you dealing with a cent per cent? She looked a little conscience-stricken, but demanded hotly, Did Felix tell you that? I had not thought he could use me so shabbily. The Viscount was incensed with Mr. Heatherset, but he informed his erring sister, in a few pithy words, that she might think herself much obliged to him. He then drew a picture of the horrifying fates that overtook persons so cork-brained as to walk into the clutches of usurers, moralised in a very edifying way on the evils of improvidence, and demanded from Nell a solemn promise that she would never again try to visit Jew King or any other money-lender. "'And if you think jauntering to ruin is something to go into whoops over,' he added wrathfully, "'let me tell you that you much mistake the matter.' "'Oh, no, in indeed I don't,' Nell said, trying to speak soberly. "'It... it was just that I... I can't help laughing when you talk like that about being improvident and... and careless and... and all the things you are yourself, die. She saw that this remark had had anything but a softening effect, and said contritely, I will never do so again. Of course, it would be very bad if I were to continue borrowing, but that I had not the least intention of doing. I should have paid the money back after quarter day, I promise you. I dare say, and I found yourself in the basket again before the cat had time to lick her ear. Don't I know it, returned the Viscount with feeling. And why the devil you had to meddle when you knew I had the business in hand, the Lord alone knows. Yes, but I thought perhaps it would be better if I did the thing myself, said Nell, frankly, in case you did anything dreadful. Oh, you did, did you? Coming in too strong, Nell. What the deuce should I do, pray? Well, to own the truth, she confessed, I was afraid you might hold someone up. Afraid I might hold someone up? gasped Dysart. Well, upon my soul, a pretty notion you have of me, by God. You held me up, Nell pointed out. And if I hadn't recognized you, you would have robbed me. You know you would. If that doesn't beat all hollow, ejaculated Dysart. Well, all I meant to do was to have sold your cursed jewelry for you. If you think I should have kept a groat of the ready for myself, you're fair and far off, my girl. No, but it was a desperate thing to do, Di, and it quite cut up my peace. I can't but wonder what next you may do, which puts me in high fidgets, because... Gammon, interrupted Dysart. Well, I wasn't even going to take Letty's trinkets. What's more, this is all hum dudgeon. You wouldn't have cared a button for losing your jewels, now would you? N no, but... "'and you'd have been devilish thankful not to have recognised me "'if I'd handed over the dibs to you next day. "'And it's my belief,' pursued the Viscount relentlessly, "'that you'd have taken good care not to have asked me how I'd come by them.' "'Stricken,' she said. "'Oh, Di, I am sadly afraid that that is true. "'It is the most mortifying reflection, too.' "'Stuff,' said the Viscount contemptuously. Now, there's no need for you to sit there looking as blue as a razor, Nell. I don't mean to leave you in the lurch, I promise you. I've got one or two capital notions in my head, but I can't raise the wind all in a trice, so it ain't a bit of use fretting like a fly in a tar box. I want him to know every time you see me what I've been doing. Give me a week and see if I don't have the business blocked at both ends. She regarded him in some apprehension. What notions have you in your head, Di? Never you mind, he replied crushingly. One notion I've got is that the less you know about it, the better. Her apprehension grew. She said, I won't tease you, but I think I would rather know. Yes, I dare say. But you can't expect me to pull you out from under the hatches if you turn maggoty every time I hit on a scheme, said the Viscount. And that's just what you would do, for you seem to me to be regularly betwattled. I am very sorry, she said humbly. I do try to take it with composure, 
but it is excessively hard to do so when one is in such affliction, Di. Every time I hear the door knock, I think it may perhaps be Laval coming to demand her money from Cardross, and alarm suspends all my faculties. Now don't be such a goose cap, Nell, recommended the Viscount, putting his arm round her shoulders and giving her a slight hug. She won't do that, not for a week or two at all events. You may depend upon it, she knows, if you don't, that it must take you a little while to raise the ready. Aye, and unless she's as big a greenhead as you are yourself, which it stands to reason she can't be, she knows you'll pay her, he added shrewdly. All she meant to do was to frighten you into paying down the dust as soon as possible. She'll give you a week's grace at the least, and very likely longer. When does Cardross come back to town? On Monday, I think. I am not perfectly sure, but he said that he would be away for a sere night. Nell was silent for a moment, and then said, turning her face away, I quite dread his coming, and that is more lowering than all the rest. He was spared the necessity of answering her by Letty's coming back into the room at that moment. She was wearing her hat and a light shawl draped gracefully across her elbows and she had come merely to take leave of Nell and to inform her that she should send the carriage back immediately from her aunt's house in case her sister should be needing the services of the coachman. She pointedly ignored the Viscount, but kissed Nell's cheek very affectionately and told her not to dream of sending the carriage to fetch her away from Bryanston Square since her aunt would undoubtedly provide for her safe return. "'All that finery just for an aunt,' said Dysart, critically surveying her. "'I must say, that's a deuced fetching bonnet.' Becoming aware of his existence, Letty raised her brows as haughtily as she could, and said in freezing accents, "'You are too kind, sir.' "'Silly chit,' said Dysart indulgently. Her eyes flashed but Nell intervened hastily, before she could again cross swords with her incorrigible tormentor. "'You look charmingly,' she assured her, edging her towards the door. "'I will come and see you into the carriage. "'Will you be warm enough, do you think, with only that shawl?' "'No, I dare say I shan't be,' Letty replied candidly. "'But it is so dowdy to wear a pelisse.' She paused in the hall to draw on her gloves, and said in a brooding tone, I don't wish to distress you, Nell, but I think Dysart is the most odious, uncivil person I ever met. Nell laughed. Yes, indeed, I'm sure you must. The thing is, you see, that because you are my sister, he treats you as though you were his as well. My brother has a great many faults, but he doesn't use me in that fashion. No, for he is so much older than you. If you had had one of your own age, you wouldn't be such a goose as to let Di put you in a myth, Nell said, smiling. I am excessively thankful that I have not one, and I assure you, Nell, I feel for you. Thank you. Mine is a hard case indeed, Nell said, her eyes brimful of amusement. You nonsensical creature. There, don't take me in aversion as well. Goodbye. You will say everything from me to your aunt that is proper, if you please. I fear she may hold me to blame for your neglect of her, but I hope she may give me credit for sparing you to her today. She spoke lightly, but she was very sensible of Mrs. Thorne's claims on Letty. Cardross, believing that Letty's faults were to be laid at the poor lady's door, might wish to detach her from that household, but Nell could never bring herself to promote this object. Indeed, she had more than once suggested to Letty that she should pay her aunt a morning visit. It did not surprise her to learn that Mrs. Thorne thought herself ill-used, for she too thought that Letty showed sadly little observance to one who had stood to her in place of her mother. She would, in fact, have been very much surprised had she known that so far from begging her niece to visit her that morning, Mrs. Thorne had not the smallest notion that she was to receive this treat, and had gone out with her daughter Fanny on a tour of the silk warehouses. 
It was Miss Selina Thorne who awaited Letty, and as soon as she saw the carriage draw up outside the house, she came running down from the drawing-room to greet her, which she did with every manifestation of surprise and delight, whispering, however, in a very dramatic way as she kissed her, Have no fear, all is safe. She then said, for the benefit of the servant who had admitted Letty into the house, How glad I am I didn't go with Mamma and Fanny. Come upstairs, love, I have a hundred things to tell you. She was a fine-looking girl, a little younger than Letty, but very much larger. Beside her exquisite cousin she appeared over buxom, a little clumsy, but she did not resent this in the least. She was as good-natured as her mother, liked to think that she had a great deal of sensibility, and had so romantic a disposition that she was inclined to think real life wretchedly flat, and to fancy that she would have found herself very much more at home in one of Mrs. Radcliffe's famous novels. Having swept Letty up to the drawing-room, she shut the door and said, lowering her voice conspiratorially, My sweetest life, such a morning as I have had, I thought we must be wholly undone, for Mamma almost commanded me to go with her. I was obliged to prevaricate a little. I said that I had a headache, and so it passed off at last though I was frightened almost out of my senses by her dawdling so much that it seemed she and Fanny would not be gone before you reached the house. How delightfully you look! Mr. Allendale will be in raptures. If he doesn't fail, Letty said, I begged him most particularly to meet me here today, but it might not be possible, perhaps. If there is a press of business, you know, he might be detained all day at the Foreign Office. Only would he not have contrived to send me word? Miss Thorne was strongly of the opinion that the violence of Mr. Allendale's feelings would outweigh all other considerations. She drew Letty to the window to watch for his arrival, for she had formed the intention of running down to admit him into the house before he could advertise his presence to the servants by knocking on the door. For it would be fatal if Mamma were to discover that he had been here. If her suspicions were aroused, depend upon it, she would instantly go to your brother, for she likes the connection as little as he does. She was talking about it only yesterday, calling it a shockingly bad match, and wondering that Mr. Allendale should be so encroaching. I kept my eyes lowered and my thoughts locked in my bosom. But you may guess how I felt on hearing such words from one whom I had believed to be all sensibility. Oh, my dearest Letty, I vowed to myself that if any exertion on my part could save you from the misery of being sacrificed to pride and consequence, it should not be lacking. Letty thanked her, but said in a more practical spirit, that since it was very unlikely that Cardross would listen to her advice, there was really nothing that she could do to achieve this noble end. Miss Thorne, who had embraced with enthusiasm the role of go-between so suddenly thrust upon her, was daunted. Upon reflection, she was obliged to own that the ways in which a young lady in her seventeenth year could aid a pair of star-crossed lovers were few. In the fastness of her bedchamber, it was possible to weave agreeable romances in which she played a leading and often heroic role. No, blessed of girls, we owe it all to you, declared Mr. Allendale, having been joined in wedlock to Letty upon the eve of her marriage to a nobleman of dissolute habits, chosen for her by her brother, by a clergyman smuggled into the house at dead of night through the agency of her devoted cousin. In these romances, Selina overcame all difficulties by ignoring them. But in the cold light of day, she was not so lost in dreams as to be unable to perceive that in a world depressingly humdrum, certain insurmountable obstacles stood in the way of her ambition, not the least of which was Mr. Allendale himself. Though Letty would perceive in a flash the beauty of that marriage scene in a dim room lit by a single branch of candles held up by her cousin, 
it would probably take a great deal of persuasion to induce the ardent lover to lend himself to such an improper proceeding. As for the indispensable cleric, not the wildest optimist could suppose that the Reverend William Tuxted, who happened to be the only clergyman with whom Selina was well acquainted, could be suborned by any means whatsoever into performing his part in the affair. Melancholy though they were, these considerations had not the power to depress Selina for long. Letty's love affair might not attain the heights of drama, but it was still a very romantic story. And there was comfort in the thought that without her cousin's assistance, she would have been hard put to it to have contrived a clandestine meeting with her suitor. Selina's good offices had not been required to promote her elder sister's espousals, and nothing in her opinion could have been more insipid than Maria's marriage to Mr. Thistleton, unless it were Fanny's betrothal to Mr. Humby, an event which had taken place on the previous evening. Neither lady had encountered the least opposition, each gentleman being possessed of a genteel fortune and a situation in life which made him a very eligible suitor. Fanny's betrothal was perhaps more tolerable than Maria's, Mr. Humby having been unknown to the thorns until he began to dangle after her. This, it must be allowed, was less deplorable than Maria's marriage to John Thistleton, whom she had known all her life. But Miss Selina Thorne was going to think herself pretty hardly used if fate did not provide for her a dashing lover of such hopeless ineligibility as must assure for her the most determined parental opposition accompanied by persecution, which she would bear with the greatest heroism and culminating in an elopement. Pending the appearance on the horizon of this gentleman, she was prepared to throw herself heart and soul into Letty's cause. She found no difficulty in crediting Cardross with all the attributes of a tyrant. And if Mr. Allendale's propriety seemed at first to indicate that there was little hope of his engaging on any desperate action, she soon decided that this was the expression not of an innate respectability, but of interesting reserve. She was giving Letty an account of the degrading congratulations which had greeted the news of Fanny's betrothal when she caught sight of Mr. Allendale approaching the house. She at once put her plan into execution, flying with such swift feet down the stairs that she reached the front door considerably in advance of him and found herself inviting only the ambient air to come in and fear nothing. However, Mr. Allendale soon arrived, and from having rehearsed, though involuntarily, her speech of welcome, she was able to improve on it. "'I knew you would not fail,' she uttered. "'I will lead you to her immediately. Do not fear that you will be interrupted. Not a soul knows of your coming. Hush!' Mr. Allendale, already surprised to find the front door being held open by one of the daughters of the house, blinked at her. "'I beg your pardon?' he said. "'Do not speak so loud,' she admonished him. "'The servants must not suspect your presence.' "'But how is this?' he demanded. "'Is not Mrs. Thorne at home?' "'No, no, you have nothing to fear,' she assured him. "'She and my sister are gone into the city. "'If they should return, you may depend on me to warn you of their approach.' Oh, I, "'I should not be here,' he said, looking vexed. It is quite improper for me to be visiting the house in Mrs. Thorne's absence. She was somewhat daunted by this prosaic attitude, but she made a gallant recover. This is no time to be considering the proprieties, she said earnestly. Your case is now desperate, and strive though she may to support her spirits under this crushing blow, my cousin is in the greatest affliction. You must come to her immediately. The thought of his Letty's agony made Mr. Allendale turn pale, but still he hung back. "'I had not supposed that the assignation was of a clandestine nature,' he said. "'I cannot think it right. I assured Lord Cardross that such conduct was repugnant to me, and to be visiting your cousin behind his back, and in such a way, 
cannot be thought to be the part of a man of honour. None of Selina's romantic schemes had included a lover who had to be urged into the presence of his inamorata, and could she but have found a substitute to take his place in the drama, she would then and there have thrust Mr. Allendale out of the house. But since she knew of no substitute, and was rather doubtful of Letty's willingness to accept one, she was obliged to make the best of the unpromising material to her hand. I am persuaded you will not permit such trifling scruples to keep you from Letty's side, she said. Only consider her agitation. She is quite worn down by despair, and I should not wonder at it if her mind were to become wholly overset. Mr. Allendale was but human. The dreadful picture conjured up by these words took from him all power of resistance, and without further argument he followed Selina up the stairs. "'I have brought him to you, dearest,' announced Selina, throwing open the door into the drawing-room. Mr. Allendale's afflicted love, who had been trying the effect of a slightly different tilt to her fetching new hat, turned away from the looking-glass and showed him a countenance glowing with health and beauty. "'Thank goodness you are come. I have been quite in a worry, thinking that perhaps you might not be able to.' To be sure, I should have known that you would contrive it by some means or other. Dear Jeremy! Selina could have improved upon this speech, but she had no fault to find with the way in which Letty cast herself upon Mr. Allendale's broad bosom and flung both arms about his neck. This was a spectacle which might well have impelled Cardross to have consigned his ward to a strict seminary for young ladies of quality, but it afforded Selina intense, if vicarious, gratification. Lingering for long enough to see that Mr. Allendale, his propriety notwithstanding, was returning this artless embrace with a fervour that made Letty squeak and protest that he was crushing her ribs, she withdrew reluctantly to take up a post of vantage on the half-landing. Mr. Allendale, casting an uneasy glance over his shoulder, was relieved to see that she had left the room. Relaxing his hold on Letty, he said seriously, "'You know, my love, this is not at all the thing. That cousin of yours... "'Oh, do not mind her,' Letty said. "'She will never betray us.' "'No, but for a girl of her age, why, she is not yet out, I believe. "'It is very shocking.' "'Fiddle,' said Letty drawing him to the sofa and sitting down beside him there. "'We have so much to discuss, Jeremy. This dreadful news which you sent me, six weeks. Oh, dearest, pray tell them you won't go.' Mr. Arundel was by this time pretty well acquainted with his love, but this ingenuous plea startled him. "'Not go? But my sweetest life!' "'It is too soon,' she urged. "'If you are to sail in six weeks' time, "'only consider the difficulties that confront us. "'I have the most melancholy persuasion "'that I can never, in so short a time, "'prevail upon Giles to consent to our marriage.' "'He possessed himself of her hands "'and sat holding them in a close grasp. "'Letty, you will never prevail upon him to do so,' "'he said heavily. She stared at him, her eyes round in astonishment. Never! Oh, how absurd! Of course I shall. It is merely that this comes so suddenly, before he has grown accustomed to the notion you know. He shook his head. He will do everything that lies within his power to prevent our marriage. I have been as sure as a man may be of that ever since the day I called in Grosvenor Square. Nor can I blame him. "'From the worldly standpoint—' "'Well, I can blame him,' Letty interrupted, "'her eyes flashing and her colour considerably heightened. "'If I do not care a fig for worldly considerations, "'I am sure he need not. "'And if my happiness means so little to him, "'I shall think myself perfectly justified in marrying you "'despite of anything he may say.' "'He got up and began to pace about the room, "'kneading one fist into the palm of his other hand.' If it were only possible, I do not know but what, with this appointment and my prospects, which I do not scruple to say are excellent, 
I too should think myself justified, but it is to no purpose. Circumstances have placed us wholly in his power. What? cried Letty. No such thing. I am not in any one's power, and I hope you are not either. You are under age, he said gloomily. Oh, well, yes, she conceded. But if we were to be married, he would be obliged to countenance it, because he would dislike excessively to make a scandal. He was silent for a moment. When he did speak, it was in a voice of deep mortification, and as though the words were forced from him. In his power, because I am unable to support a wife. That is what renders my position so hopeless. I would. Try not to be expensive, offered Letty. He threw her a warm look, but said, You are used to enjoy the elegancies of life. As my affairs now stand, I cannot even offer you its comforts. To remove you from the protection of your brother, only to place you in a situation where you would be obliged to practice the most stringent economy, would be the action of a scoundrel. I must not. Indeed, I will not do it. No, for I don't think I could practice stringent economies, agreed Letty, considering the matter in an impartial spirit. But we could live upon my expectations, couldn't we? Borrow on your expectations? No, a thousand times no, declared Mr. Allendale, with every evidence of repulsion. Well, it is what Nell's brother does, argued Letty. I don't know precisely how he contrives to do it, but if he can, I'm persuaded I could, too, for mine are much better than his, you know. Put it out of your mind, begged Mr. Allendale, blanching visibly at the appalling vision of debt conjured up by her artless suggestion. Nothing shall prevail upon me to take Lord Dysart for my model. No, very true, she replied, recalling his lordship's unamiable behaviour. I am sure he is the most ramshackle person, besides being excessively disagreeable. Only what is to be done if you don't think my allowance sufficient? I have five hundred pounds a year, you know, and I need spend very little of it on my dresses, because I have a great many already. She stopped, and her eyes brightened. Yes. And besides that, I have suddenly had an excellent notion. I can very well buy hundreds of ells of silk and muslin and cambric, enough to set me up for years, I dare say, and tell all the mercers to send their bills to Giles. Good God! ejaculated Mr. Allendale, pausing in his perambulations to gaze upon her with starting eyes. She perceived that her suggestion had not found favour. You don't think that is what I should do. But consider, Jeremy, even if you refuse to pay, and I don't think that in the least likely, they couldn't dun me, because I should be in South America, and so all would be well. It spoke volumes for the depth of Mr. Allendale's love, that after the first stunned moment, he recovered from an involuntary recoil, and realized that this ingenious solution to the difficulties arose not from depravity, but from a vast and touching innocence. That, he said gently, would be dishonest, my dearest. Oh, said Letty. It was plain that she was unconvinced. Mr. Allendale was aware that it behoved him to bring her to a more proper frame of mind, but he felt, at this present, unequal to the task, and merely said, Besides... If I were to marry you out of hand, there can be little doubt that Cardross would discontinue your allowance. She was quite incredulous. No, he would not be so shabby. He warned me that your fortune remains in his hands until you attain the age of twenty-five. How much of its income you may enjoy is at his discretion. I could not mistake his meaning. Twenty? Five, gasped Letty. Of all the infamous things, why, I shall be quite old. I declare I am excessively thankful that I can't remember my papa, for if he served me such a trick as that, he must have been the most detestable man. You would think he meant, Giles, to chouse me out of my inheritance. 
"'No, there is no question of such a thing as that,' said Mr. Allendale, painstakingly. "'It is only—' "'Well, I don't mean to be worsted by either of them, and so I promise you,' Lassie said briskly. "'Depend upon it, I shall hit upon a way of bringing Giles about. "'But I must own, love, that it makes it very hard if you must sail so soon. "'Jeremy, pray do not.' "'You don't understand,' he said. "'I could not refuse such an adventitious appointment. "'You would not have me do so.' "'Oh, no, not refuse it. "'But could you not tell them that it is not perfectly convenient to you to go to Brazil so soon? "'Tell them that you will go in three months. "'I am persuaded we shall have come about by then.' "'This drew a slight, melancholy smile from him, but he shook his head. "'No, indeed, I could not do such a thing. "'Consider, dearest, how unwise in me it would be to offend my kind patron.' I owe this advancement to Lord Roxwell, you know, and to give the least appearance of ingratitude. I've been thinking about that, she interrupted. I dare say he was anxious to oblige you, only the thing is that he has quite mistaken the matter. How so? he demanded, looking bewildered. He was good enough to say that he had my advancement very much to heart, certainly. I believe I told you that he held my father in great affection. "'Yes, you did, and it has given me a very good notion. "'You must go to him instantly and tell him that you would prefer to be made ambassador. "'Tell him that I would prefer to be made ambassador?' repeated Mr. Allendale in a bemused voice. "'In a very civil way, of course,' she urged, "'seeing that her notion was not having that success with him which it deserved.' You could say that now you have had time to consider the matter, you feel that it would be better if you became an ambassador, or... But you will know just how to say it in an unexceptionable way. No, said Mr. Allendale, with a good deal of conviction. I do not know. My dearest life, you don't know. You have not the least conception. It will be many years before I can hope to be so elevated. As for asking Lord Roxwell... "'Good God!' "'Should you prefer it if I were to ask him?' inquired Letty. "'I am not particularly acquainted with him, but Giles knows him, and we meet him forever at parties.' Mr. Allendale sat down again beside her, and grasped both her hands. "'Letty, promise me you will do no such thing,' he begged. "'It is not to be thought of. Believe me, it would be quite disastrous.' "'Would it?' "'Then I won't, of course, and I expect it will answer best for you to approach him after all,' said Letty sunnily. "'The only thing is that perhaps you might not like to tell him that you would make an excellent ambassador, while for me there could be nothing easier.' Much moved, Mr. Allendale pressed several kisses onto her hands, ejaculating in a thickened voice, "'So sweet, so innocent! Alas, no, my love, it cannot be!' I must be content with what is offered to me, and indeed it is more than ever I expected. Well, I am sure it is not more than you deserve, said Letty warmly. However, if you believe it would be useless to apply to Lord Roxwell, I won't tease you. We must think of some other scheme. She spoke with optimism, but Mr. Allendale sighed. I wish we might, but my thoughts lead me only to the melancholy necessity of waiting. If your present allowance were secured to you, I should be tempted indeed, though I trust I should find the strength to withstand the impulse of my heart. Situated as we both are, you dependent upon your brother's caprice, I with such charges upon my purse as I cannot but consider sacred, our case is hopeless. One of my sisters is on the point, I hope, of contracting an eligible marriage. My uncle has always promised to present Philip to a living, as soon as he shall have been inducted into holy orders, which I trust will be this year. But Edward is still at school, and Tom must be sent to join him in September. I could not reconcile it with my conscience, love, to leave my widowed parent to bear, without assistance, these heavy charges. Letty agree to this, but without enthusiasm. She ventured to say, 
You don't feel that perhaps Tom would as lief not go to school? Mr. Allendale dismissed unhesitatingly a tentative suggestion which would have won for Letty her future brother-in-law's esteem and approval. Perhaps your uncle would pay for Tom. He shook his head. I fear... You must know that he has himself a numerous progeny, and has, besides, been responsible for a part of Philip's education. Philip is his godson, but it would not be right to expect him to provide for Edward or Tom. A depressed silence fell. Mr. Allendale broke it, saying with a praiseworthy attempt to speak cheerfully, We must be patient. It will be very hard, but we shall have the future to look forward to. Cardross has said that if we are of the same two minds when I return from Brazil, he will not then withhold his consent. I believe him to be a man of his word, and that thought, that hope, will help us to bear with fortitude our separation. I do not consider him unfeeling, and I trust he will not forbid us to correspond with each other. He may forbid it if he chooses, but I shall not pay the least heed declared Letty, her voice trembling. Only I am not a good hand at letter-writing, and I don't wish to correspond with you. I wish to be with you. Oh, don't talk of our being separated, Jeremy. I can't bear it, and I won't bear it. Cardross must and shall continue to pay my allowance. He could not feel hopeful. Nor did he think well of a scheme for Cardross's subjection, which depended, for its success, on her ability to bring herself to the brink of a decline by refusing to let a morsel of food pass her lips. Letty then broke into a passion of weeping, and by the time he had soothed and petted her into a calmer state, he was obliged to tear himself from her side. His haggard countenance, when he emerged from the drawing-room, did much to restore Selina's good opinion of him, and when she found her cousin still hiccuping on convulsive sobs, she felt that matters were progressing just as they should. It now only remained for Letty to suffer abominable persecution at the hands of her cruel guardian. "'Well, I had as lief not be persecuted, thank you,' said Letty crossly, Besides, he is persecuting me. Not enough, declared Selina positively. Do you think, if you threatened to run away, that he would lock you in an attic at the top of the house? No, of course he wouldn't, you silly creature. They do in general, argued Selina. If only you could prevail upon him to, you could throw a note down from the window to me, and I would instantly deliver it to Mr. Allendale. He would feel himself bound to rescue you, and then you could fly to the border. That only happens in novels, said Letty scornfully. I should like to know how Jeremy could possibly rescue me. Why, he could not even enter the house without knocking on the door, and what, pray, would you have him say to the porter? I suppose there isn't a secret way into the house, asked Selina, rather daunted. Of course not. You only find them in castles. No, that is not true at all, Selina cried triumphantly, because I have seen a secret way into quite a commonplace house. I don't precisely remember where it was, but I drove there when Mamma took Fanny and me to stay with my uncle in Somerset. It is of no consequence where it is, because there are no secret doors in Grosvenor Square. No, agreed Selina regretfully. Another idea presented itself to her, but although her eyes brightened momentarily, they clouded at the thought of Mr. Allendale gaining an entrance to Cardross House in the disguise of a sweep. And now I come to think of it, said Letty, clinching the matter. The attics are all as full as they can hold with servants. I wish you will stop talking nonsense like a goose. It is not nonsense. You did not think it so when we read that capital story about the girl who was imprisoned by her uncle so that she should consent to wed his son, the one that had a villainous aspect and two savage mastiffs, and books, cried Letty impatiently. But this is real.
Chapter 8 Letty remained in Bryanston Square all day, and great was Mrs. Thorne's delight to find her there when she returned from a protracted shopping expedition with Fanny. Silks and muslins for the making of Fanny's bride clothes had been their object, and while the tour of the warehouses had been in the nature of a preliminary skirmish, so much had been bought, and so many patents had been brought home to be studied at leisure, that little else was talked of during the remainder of Letty's visit. Mrs. Thorne did indeed notice that she was rather languid in spirit, but this circumstance she ascribed to pique, and paid no heed to it, beyond remarking, not very felicitously, that in spite of her three years' seniority, she had never expected Fanny to go off before her cousin. Nell, meanwhile, spent an unexceptionable, if rather dull, day, and Sid's such sedentary occupations as netting, tatting, knotting a fringe, or trying to bring to a successful conclusion a game of patience, a new form of recreation which the Prince Regent had been so condescending as to explain to her, left her mind rather too much at liberty to fret over her troubles. She soon began to be sorry she had refused even so mild a form of entertainment as an invitation to practice French country dances at a select morning ball. In general, there never seemed to be enough time into which to fit her various engagements, for once the season was in full swing, every sort of amusement offered, from Venetian breakfasts to grand balloon ascensions and in brief respites from these she was either submitting to the ministrations of Mr. Blake, who combined a laughable coxcombry with the positive genius for cutting ladies' hair, or sitting for her portrait to Mr. Lawrence. Cardross had commissioned this full-length likeness of his lovely bride, and since Lawrence had become, since Hopner's death, the most fashionable portrait painter in England, it was going to cost him not a penny less than four hundred guineas but Mr. Blake had given her a smart new crop only a week earlier. Mr. Lawrence's work on the portrait had had to be suspended until he had recovered from an indisposition. She did not care to visit the Royal Academy's exhibition at Somerset House alone, for that would not only be dull work, but might render her an easy prey to some other unaccompanied lady, probably Miss Berry, whom one ought to admire, but could not contrive to like. London was overfull of elderly ladies who were Mamma's dear friends, and Somerset House was just the place where one might be sure of meeting them. So, after knotting a few inches of fringe, reading three pages of Corinne, rather wistfully watching some children playing at Battledore and Shuttlecock in the square garden, and trying to make up her mind to write an overdue letter to Miss Wilby, she decided that the day was too fine for such sedentary pursuits, and determined, in default of livelier amusements, to drive to Chelsea, on a visit to Tubbs Nursery Garden in the King's Road, and to select there such plants as would transform the ballroom at Cardross House into a fairy land of flowers. This lavish scheme had its birth in Letty's desire to hang the ballroom with pink calico, she had seen this novel form of decoration at one of the first balls of the season, and it had instantly hit her fancy. Hundreds of ells of calico had been gathered to form the likeness of a huge tent. Everyone had exclaimed at it, and had complimented the hostess on such a charming notion, and Letty, convinced that it would shortly become all the crack, had been alternately hectoring and cajoling Cardross for weeks past to have his own ballroom turned into a pink tent for the grand dress party to be held there at the end of the month. Unfortunately, Cardross had not admired the effect of the pink calico, and upon Letty's agreeing that to be sure calico was shabby, and it would be far more elegant, besides going one better than Lady Weldon, to use silk, he had expressed himself so unequivocally on the subject as to confirm her belief that his taste was as old-fashioned as his disposition was mean. She had not scrupled to tell him so, and his way of receiving this terrible indictment did him no honour at all. "'I know it,' he said sympathetically. 
I assure you, Letty, it astonishes even me that I could be such a hog-grubber as to grudge the expenditure of, I dare say, not above a few hundred pounds on the suitable decoration of the ballroom to set off your charms. He had cast a laughing glance towards Nell, and had added provocatively, Now, if you had asked me for blue hangings... Letty had been perfectly willing to compound for blue, but had met with no support from Nell, Nell, quite as desirous as she to cut a dash, had no notion, she thanked Letty, of imitating Lady Weldon or any other fashionable hostess. If Cardross approved, she would make the taunt exclaim much more loudly by creating a flower garden in her ballroom. It had often astonished her that hostesses made such meagre use of flowers. They should be made to gnash their teeth with envy at the result to be achieved by taste, ingenuity, and the services of a first-rate florist. Cardross promptly gave her carte blanche, and Letty, having rather reluctantly listened to her scheme, was obliged to own that it would at once be pretty and quite out of the ordinary way. So off now went to Chelsea. No sooner did Mr. Tubbs, greeting her ladyship with a flattering deference, grasped the purpose of her visit, than he became an enthusiastic supporter of it, summoning up his chief minions and rapidly devising several alternative plans for the tasteful decoration of her ballroom. They differed in many respects, but in one they were alike. They were all extremely costly. But since Cardross had said Nell might do anything she chose, provided she didn't drape his ballroom in pink calico, this consideration was of no moment. In choosing the flowers and the ferns, and discussing with Mr. Tubbs the rival merits of garlands, hanging baskets, and a trellis work set against the walls and covered with greenery, out of which flowers could be made to appear as if growing, she passed an agreeable hour, her cares for the time being forgotten. She parted from Mr. Tubbs on the most cordial terms that excellent horticulturalist begging her to do him the honour of accepting a bouquet composed of all the choice blooms she had particularly admired during her tour of the garden. It was such a large bouquet that it had to be laid on the floor of the barouche, but Mr. Tubbs did not grudge a single blossom in it. It was not every day of the week that he received so magnificent an order as Lady Cardross had given him. He assured her ladyship that she might repose the fullest confidence in his ability to achieve a result that would hold her guests spellbound with admiration. And no sooner had her barouche driven away than he took his foreman apart and exhorted him to put forth his best endeavours. For mark my words, Andy, he said earnestly, if this does not set a fashion, I shouldn't wonder at it if we were soon turning orders away. Nell was rather hopeful, too, that she might be starting a new mode. There had been a number of parties at Cardross House since her marriage, but this would be the first grand ball she had held, and she wanted people to say something more of it than that it had been a dreadful squeeze. Letty had not returned from Bryanston Square when she reached home again, so, after putting off her hat and her gloves, she occupied herself with the arrangement of her bouquet in several bowls and vases. She was trying the effect of one of these on a pie-crust table in a corner of the drawing-room when a voice said behind her, Charming! It was fortunate that she was not holding the bowl, for she must certainly have dropped it, so convulsive was the start she gave. She gasped sharply, and turned to find that Cardross had come quietly into the room and was standing by the door, quizzically regarding her. He had shed his driving coat, but he had plainly but that instant arrived in town, for he was still wearing a country habit of frock coat, buckskins, and top boots. The shock of hearing his voice when she had believed him to be a hundred miles away was severe, and her first sensation was of consternation. She made a quick recover, but not before he had seen the fright in her eyes. The quizzical look faded, to be replaced by one of searching inquiry. She exclaimed a little faintly, Cardross! Oh, how much you startled me! 
I appear rather to have dismayed you, he said, making no movement to approach her, but continuing to watch her face with hard, narrowed eyes. No, no, how could you say so, she protested, with a nervous laugh and reddening cheeks. I am so glad. I did not expect to see you until Monday, and hearing you speak so suddenly made me jump out of my skin. I beg your pardon, he replied, unsmilingly. I should, of course, have warned you of my arrival. You must try to forgive my want of tact. Giles, how absurd, she said, holding out her hand. He strolled forward and took it, bowing formally, and just touching it with his lips. He released it immediately, saying, Yes, in the manner of the farce we saw at Covent Garden and thought so stupid. I shall stop short of searching behind the curtains and under the furniture for the hidden lover. The chilly salute he had bestowed on her hand had both alarmed and distressed her, but this speech fell so wide of the mark that she laughed. In the expectation of finding your cousin Felix, it is a most improper notion, but how very funny it will be to discover him in such a situation. He smiled slightly, and some of the suspicion left his eyes. He still kept them on her face, and she found it hard to meet them. "'What is it, Nell?' he asked, after a moment. "'But indeed it is nothing. I, I, I don't understand what you can mean. Are you offended with me for having jumped so? But that was quite your own fault, you know.' He did not answer for a moment, and when he did at last speak, it was in a colourless voice. As you say. Which of your admirers bestowed that handsome bouquet on you? You have arranged it delightfully. None of them. At least, I don't flatter myself that he admires me precisely, she replied, thankful for the change of subject. Well, I had it, but this is only part of it, from Tubbs, the nursery man. I have been there today to order the flowers for our dress ball, and at parting he begged me to accept the most enormous bouquet imaginable. Did he indeed? Then it seems safe to assume that you've lodged a very handsome order with him. She looked a little anxious. Well, yes, she admitted, but it will be the prettiest ball of the season, and... And you did tell me I might spend as much as I wished on it. Certainly. I wasn't criticising you, my love. She felt impelled to justify herself, for in spite of his assurance there was an alarming want of cordiality in his voice. It is the first ball we have held here, the first grand ball, she reminded him apologetically. You wouldn't wish it to be talked of as just another jam, nothing out of the common style. My dear Nell, you have no need to excuse yourself. By all means, let it be of the first stare. Shall we give our guests pink champagne? Are you joking me? she asked cautiously. It sounds excessively elegant, but I think I never heard of it before. Oh, no, I am not joking you. I assure you it will lend great cachet to the party. More than pink calico, she ventured, a gleam of fun in the glance she cast at him. That did draw a laugh from him. Yes, or even pink silk. Where is Letty, by the by? She has gone to visit Mrs. Thorne. She will be back directly, I dare say. She fancied there was a frown in his eyes and added, You don't like that, but indeed, Giles, it would not be right to encourage her to neglect Mrs. Thorne. Very true. Tell me, Nell. What does my Aunt Chudley mean by writing to inform me that Letty's conduct at that masquerade that you took her to set everyone in a bustle? If your Aunt Chudley would be a little less busy, we should go on very well, cried Nell, flushing with wrath. She is never happy but when she is making mischief. Pray, has she any animadversions to pass on me? No, she exonerates you from all blame. Obliging of her. I hope with all my heart that you will give her a sharp set-down, Cardross. I probably shall. What, in fact, did Letty do to bring this scold down upon me? Nothing at all. 
That is to say, nothing to make a piece of work about. You know how it is with her when she is in a high gig. She allows her vivacity to carry her beyond the line of what is pleasing, but she is so young that it is only people like Lady Chudley who don't know that it is all done in innocence. And want of upbringing, he said with a sigh. I can blame no one but myself for that. You didn't, in sober truth, let her wear an improper gown, did you? Uh, no, 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 she replied guiltily. Not, not improper, precisely. I own it was not just the thing for a girl of her age, but, well, she won't wear it again, so pray don't mention it to her cardross. If it made her look like a class of female which my aunt prefers not to particularize, she most assuredly won't wear it again, he returned. Nothing of the sort. Lady Chudley knows very well that such gowns are worn by women of the first consequence. Do pray let the matter rest. To scold Letty will only set up her back, and it was my fault after all. I don't mean to scold either of you, but I must own no. "'that I could wish you had put your foot down,' he said, looking displeased. "'Perhaps I should have done so,' she replied in a mortified tone. "'I am very sorry.' "'Yes. Well, never mind. "'I don't doubt that it is very hard for you to check Letty's starts. "'And while we are speaking of the masquerade, "'what in heaven's name is this extraordinary story "'I have been hearing about Dysards holding you up on the road to Chiswick?' Oh, good God! Lady Chudley knows nothing of that, surely, she exclaimed, rather aghast. No, I had it from your coachman. According to him, your carriage was stopped by Dysart and two companions, all of them disguised as highwaymen. It seems quite incredible even in Dysart, but I can hardly suppose that Geoffrey would entertain me with a Canterbury story. Do you mind explaining the matter to me? She had forgotten that her servants would be very likely to tell him of Dysart's strange exploit, and for an ignoble moment wished that she had had the forethought to have bought their silence. She was instantly ashamed of herself, and said, her colour rising, Oh, it was one of Di's mad-brained hoaxes, and a great deal too bad of him. I must own that I hoped it wouldn't come to your ears. That, Nell, is patent. Yes, I mean, I knew you would be vexed. There was no harm in it. It, it all arose out of a, a, a stupid wager, but of course it was the most improper thing to do, and so I told him. All arose out of a wager, he repeated incredulously. With which of his associates did Dysart see fit to make you the subject of a wager? N not with any of them, she stammered. "'frightened by the look on his face. "'Then what the devil do you mean?' he demanded. "'It was with me,' she said, improvising desperately. "'We we were talking about masquerades, "'and I said it was nonsense to suppose "'that one wouldn't recognize somebody one knew well "'just because they wore a mask. "'Di, Di said that he would prove me wrong, and, "'and that was how it was. "'Only I did recognize him, so I won the wager.' gratifying. Did you also recognize his companions? No. That is, it was only Mr. Fancott, she said imploringly. Oh, and Joe, of course, Di's groom, but he doesn't signify, because he has always been with us ever since I could remember. Pray, Cardros, don't be vexed with Di. Vexed with him? I am very much more than vexed with him. To be giving you such a fright for the sake of a prank I should find it hard to pardon in a schoolboy goes beyond anything of which I believed him to be capable, he said wrathfully. I wasn't frightened, she assured him, only a very little, at all events. Oh, he said grimly, what then made you scream? Her eyes sparkled with indignation. I did not scream. I would scorn to do anything so paltry. It was Letty who screamed. How chicken-hearted of her, to be sure, he said sardonically. Well, that's what I thought, she said candidly. Are you quite blinded by your doting fondness for Dysart, he demanded. 
He is fortunate to possess a sister who can find excuses for his every folly, his every extravagance, and for such larks as this latest exploit. I am aware, I have long been aware, that he holds a place in your affections that is second to none, but take care what you are about. Encourage him to think he may turn to you in any extremity. Smile upon kick-ups unworthy of a freshman. You will not smile when the high spirits you now regard with such indulgence carry him beyond the line of what even his cronies will pardon. She shrank a little from the harshness in his voice, but she was quick to recognize the note of jealousy in it. She heard it with a leap of the heart, and it took from his words all power of wounding, Instead of flying to Dysart's defence, she said merely, Indeed I didn't smile upon such a prank. It was very bad, quite unbecoming, but it is unjust in you, Cardros, to say that his wildness will lead him into doing anything wicked. You dislike him very much, but that is going too far. No, I don't dislike him, he replied in a more moderate tone. On the contrary... I like him well enough to wish to be of real service to him. You think me unjust, but you may believe that I know what I am saying when I tell you that his present way of life is ruinous. She said in swift alarm, Oh, pray, pray, don't thrust him into the army. I have no power to thrust him into the army. I own I have offered to buy him a commission, and I have not the smallest doubt that there is nothing I might do for him which he would like better, or which would be of more benefit to him. If the only bar in the way of his accepting it is your father's dislike of the project, I will engage to make all right in that quarter. No, it is not that. I should not say such a thing, but I am afraid that I doesn't care much for what poor papa wishes. But Mamma has made him promise he wouldn't do it, and however ramshackle you may think him, Di doesn't break his promises. If that is how the case stands, he said, I recommend you, my dear, to use your best endeavours to persuade your mother to release him from a promise which I don't scruple to tell you should never have been extracted from him. I could not. Oh, she would sink under the very thought of his exposing himself to all the dangers of war. She hesitated, and then said, with a little difficulty, Mamma has had so many trials to bear. For Papa, you know. Yes, I know, he replied. For that very reason I am persuaded that if she was aware of the truce, she would think the hazards of war less perilous than those of the metropolis. Living as she now must, so far from London, I fancy she cannot know how closely Dysart is following an example she must dread. She looked a little frightened, but said, I know he is sadly wild and, and expensive, but surely no worse than that. Well, that is bad enough, he replied. He saw that she was inclined to question him more closely, but he was already vexed that he had allowed his irritation to betray him into saying so much. Before she could speak again, he had turned the subject, and very soon after he left her saying that he must change his habit. Whatever bitter feelings he might cherish, he could not shock her by disclosing the full sum of Dysart's folly. She probably did not even know of that little narrow pink room behind the stage at the opera house, where the dancers practised their steps in front of long pier-glasses, and any bark in search of amateur adventures could have his pick of the West End comets. Dysart was the familiar figure in that saloon, and so was his latest cher ami. Nell had certainly seen him driving with this article of virtue, a dasher of the first water too, reflected Cardros, but what she had made of her one couldn't tell. She had asked no questions, so perhaps she had guessed, but she didn't guess that Dysart frequently sallied forth with the peeper day boys, starting the evening with a rump and dozen at longs, and gravitating thence to a less respectable world of which she was wholly ignorant. It diverted the wilder blades to mix on equal terms with the roughest elements of society. Buttoning up, they would plunge into the back slums of Tottiel Fields, rubbing shoulders, and often falling into a mill with all sorts, from honest coal-porters to petermen. 
they saw badger baiting in the reeking squalor of Charles's, where a man must be a very fly cove to avoid having his pockets picked. They rubbed shoulders with bing boys and their molishes in the sluiceries, became half sprung on blue ruin in these gin shops, and wandering eastward, deep cut at the field of blood. The night music of the watchman's rattles marked their progress through the sleeping town. Often a drowsing Charlie was overturned in his box and sent sprawling into the kennel. Many were the respectable householders brought down to their doors on false alarms of fire or thieves. Sometimes these larks ended in a roundhouse with its sequel of Bow Street, a false name and a fine. Sometimes a blade, fortunate enough to be numbered amongst Mother Butler's favourites, sought refuge at the finish, and spent what was left of the night snoring on a settle beside the dying embers of the fire in the tap. No, Nell knew nothing of such exploits as these, and no prompting of jealousy was going to seduce her husband into enlightening her. The shock would be severe, and her innocence as much as her affection for Dysart would lead her to regard his excesses in a far more serious light than that in which they appeared to her husband. He was vexed by them, and he viewed their continuance with grim foreboding, but he believed that they sprang from the boredom of idleness rather than from any ingrained depravity. What disturbed him far more was the suspicion he had formed that Dysart, in his restless quest for novelty and excitement, had lately become enrolled as a member of the Beggars' Club. This decidedly unsavoury institution had its locality in a cellar at the back of Broad Street, and was generally presided over by the Earl of Barrymore, with Colonel George Hanger as his vice. It was patronised by all the raff of town, and such persons as those who thought it amusing to eat their suppers out of holes carved in the long table, and with knives and forks that were chained to their places. There was no particular harm in this, but the evils that could accrue from a young man getting into Barrymore's set were grave enough, Cardross knew, to alarm even so casual a parent as Lord Pevensey. Old Georgie Hanger, for all his eccentricities, exercised little influence over the younger men. He was over sixty, and after a varied career which began at Eton, rose to a commission in the first foot guards, reached its nadir in the King's Bench prison, and included an excursion into trade, when, upon his discharge from the abbot's priory, he set up as a coal merchant. He had contrived to get himself restored to full pay, and was now living rather more moderately. His age and his oddities caused him to be tolerated by society, but his manners were too coarse to render him an attractive figure, and to do him justice, he had not the smallest desire either to figure as the leader of a set or to corrupt the morals of its members. The noble Earl of Barrymore was a bird of another feather. Neither his rank nor his achievements on the box or in the saddle sufficed to make him acceptable to the tongue. He had been one of the founders of the Whip Club. He had introduced the fashionable practice of driving with a small tiger perched up beside him. His colours were to be seen on any race course, but society, with the exception of the Prince Regent, who too often appeared to have a strong predilection for disreputable company, was obstinate in avoiding him. An Irish peer, he had inherited the title from his brother, who had earned for himself the unenviable nickname of Hellgate. This circumstance, coupled with the possession of a club foot, naturally led to his being dubbed Cripplegate. A younger brother in orders was known as Newgate, from having, according to his boast, been imprisoned in every jail in the country. And an excessively foul-mouthed sister became, inevitably, Billingsgate. Cripplegate, with his fame as a nonsuch, his cool daring in the saddle, and his dark reputation, constituted a real danger to such reckless young bloods as Dysart. And if the hint dropped in Cardross's ear held so much as a grain of truth, neither Lady Pevensey's maternal fears nor Nell's distress at being separated from her brother was going to prevent his putting a summary end to that troublesome young man's career as a town buck of the first cut. 
the demon of jealousy apart, he liked Dysart well enough to make a push to save him from the consequences of his own folly. For Nell's sake, he was prepared even to undertake the disagreeable task of disclosing to Lord Pevensey the exact nature of the course his heir was treading. He could only hope that the news would not prove fatal to his lordship's shattered constitution, but he thought it extremely probable that a second stroke might result from it, and could only trust that it would not prove necessary for him to approach his father-in-law. Lord Pevensey might shrug up his shoulders at a tale of fashionable dissipations, but in his day not the most dissolute rake amongst the upper ten thousand sought diversion in the back slums. Unless the stroke he had already suffered had rendered him very much more incapable than Cardros had reason to suppose, he could be trusted to overbear his lady's opposition the instant he received the intelligence that Dysart was not only associating on the friendliest terms with scamps, pads and drivers, but was also in a fair way to becoming a boon companion of one whom his lordship had been amongst the first to ostracize. Chapter 9 Cardross feared that his unguarded words would lead Nell to inquire more particularly into her brother's mode of life, but in point of fact she was less disturbed by them than by the possible consequences of the story she had fabricated to account for his holding up her carriage. She had certainly been startled by what he said, but a few minutes' reflection led her to think that the jealousy she had so clearly perceived in him had led him to exaggerate. That he had so abruptly turned the subject seemed to her to lend colour to this belief, and since her own troubles were looming large, she thought very little more about the matter. Her encounter with him had quite overset her. It was a struggle to support her spirits, for never before had he treated her with such cool reserve of manner, or looked at her with such hard, searching eyes. The fault was her own. That frightening expression had not been in his face when he first had entered the room. She had been terrified that he might demand an explanation of the dismay she had betrayed, but when he had refrained, as though in disdain or indifference, she had found his cold forbearance more alarming than any display of wrath. She felt herself to have been set at a distance, and although his voice had been kinder when he had asked her what was the matter, she had not been conscious of any impulse to confide in him. In her view, no moment could have been more unpropitious for confession. Rendered suspicious by her reception of him, vexed with her for not having taken better care of his sister, and his temper dangerously exasperated by Dysart's conduct, the disclosure that his wife was again badly in debt, and had been putting forth her best endeavours to deceive him, could only be expected to act on him like a match to gunpowder. Nor did it seem at all probable that the knowledge of Dysart's motive in holding her up would lead him to regard him with more lenient eyes. In fact, far otherwise, she thought. For if she had been shocked by the scheme, it seemed safe to suppose that Cardross would utterly condemn it. Once the truth was out, Dysart would be more than likely to tell him that he had had three hundred pounds from her, and then surely the miserable tangle would be past unravelling. This melancholy conviction at once put her in mind of the immediate necessity of conveying a warning to Dysart. Cardros plainly meant to call him to book, and it would never do for him to tell a different story from hers. She sat down to dash off a note to him then and there, but she was obliged to pause several times, to wipe the blinding tears from her eyes. Try as she would to compose herself, they would keep welling up, because it was so very dreadful to be plotting with Dysart against Cardross. She had just given the sealed billet to her footman when Letty came in, and at once it occurred to her that she too must be warned to say, if Cardross should question her, that Dysart had held them up for a wager. She could feel herself blushing as she told Letty what she had said to Cardross, but Letty was not at all shocked. 
Oh, certainly, she said, taking it as a matter of course. Nell hardly knew whether to be glad or sorry. So, Giles has come home, Letty remarked, slowly pulling off her gloves. Well, I am positively glad of it. Oh, yes, Nell murmured. Of course, I mean, because, pursued Letty, a martial light in her eye, my affairs have now reached a crisis. Good God, exclaimed Nell, quite alarmed. What in the world, love? In six weeks, in less than six weeks, Jeremy sails for South America, announced Letty in a voice of doom. Oh, dear, said Nell, as soon as that. I am so very sorry. Well, you need not be, said Letty, though I own I had rather not be married in such a scrambling way. However, I don't mean to repine, for that is a small thing after all. Nell regarded her uneasily. But, dearest, there is no question. You cannot suppose that Gardros will permit it. And neither he nor you, flashed Letty, can suppose that I will permit my adored Jeremy to leave England without me. Unless he has a heart of stone, Giles cannot now refuse his consent. Nell was unable to perceive why the imminent departure of Mr. Allendale should be supposed to melt Cardross's heart, and ventured to say as much. It was ill-received. Letty broke into an impassioned diatribe. This was not very coherent, but one plain fact emerged from it. Cardross was to be given a last chance to rehabilitate his character. As far as Nell was concerned, this supplied all that was needed to set the crown on a singularly disastrous day. She begged Letty with great earnestness not to attempt to argue her case that evening, and when Letty, with a toss of her head, declared that she was not afraid of Cardross, warned her that his back had already been set up by Lady Chudley's letter. A thoughtful silence descended upon Letty. After a few moments she said, with a nonchalance that would have deceived no one, "'It is not of the least consequence.' I shan't regard it if he does give me one of his scolds. Is he very angry now? No, but, oh, a good deal displeased, I fear. I believe he won't speak of it to you, if only you won't vex him. Well, I won't say anything to him tonight, Letty decided. What a fortunate thing it is that we are going to the play. I had meant to ask you if we need, because I haven't any inclination for it. Still, it won't do to fall into a lethargy, even though Cardross is determined to break my heart. He will be very well served if I go into a decline, for although I dare say he doesn't care a button what becomes of me, I shall leave a letter to be opened after my death, saying that it was all his doing, and he won't like that. Slightly heartened by this reflection, she went off to change her dress. With rare tact, she selected from her wardrobe a very demure half-dress of French muslin and further heightened its modesty by arranging round her shoulders a lace fichu. This led her adoring Abigail to look upon her with anxious concern, but upon the matters being explained to her, Martha entered at once into the spirit of the thing and contributed her might by substituting a pair of silk mittens for the elegant kid gloves she had previously laid out. Letty eyed them with disfavour, but consented to wear them, and presently burst upon her half-brother's sight as the embodiment of virtuous maidenhood. The effect of this modest ensemble, though not what she had expected, was good. When she entered the drawing-room, Cardross was looking stern, but after one glance at his pious little sister, his countenance relaxed. He put up his glass, the better to study her appearance, and said dryly, but with a quivering lip, "'Doing it rather too brown, Letty?' Her saintly expression melted into one of engaging mischief. She twinkled roguishly and stood on tiptoe to kiss his cheek. Dear Giles, 
What an agreeable surprise, to be sure. Turning me up sweet, my pet? She giggled. No, no. "'Tis the luckiest chance that you have come home, "'because the case is that we mean to go to the play tonight "'and have no one to escort us.' "'What an abominable girl you are,' he remarked. "'Yes, but don't be cross,' she begged. "'It would be a waste of time. "'I entertain serious thoughts, however, "'of sending you to stay with Aunt Honoria. "'She may take you to the assemblies at the upper rooms now and then.' By the by, they end punctually at eleven, but only if you are excessively well-behaved. Oh, what a horrid notion, cried Letty, shuddering. Aunt Honoria, Bath, too, of all places. But of course I should run away, to become an actress, I dare say, just to serve you out. Nonsense. She will have you in subjection within a week. She frightens me to death, he retorted. Very likely there is more steel to my nerves, I promise you. He laughed, and upon dinners being just then announced, bowed both ladies out of the door and followed them downstairs to the dining room. Bent on charming him into an acquiescent mood, Letty kept him amused by a good deal of nonsensical raillery, in which Nell took little part, merely smiling mechanically at Letty's more outrageous absurdities. Her spirits were oppressed, and she was on tenterhooks lest Letty, encouraged by her brother's indulgent mood, should think the time opportune to broach the subject of her marriage. Dinner seemed interminable, though it was, in fact, shorter than usual, his lordship not having been expected. The artist below stairs had had time only to fling together the merest travesty of a second course, supplementing the soup, the pigeons, the poulard de la Duchesse, and the morels of the first course, with a grilled breast of lamb with cucumber, prawns in a wax basket, and some cheesecakes. This very commonplace repast had not escaped censure from the steward, and Farley, who maintained a guerrilla warfare with the Gallic ruler of the kitchens, prophesied that his lordship would send a pretty sharp message downstairs. His lordship, however, made no comment. And as for her ladyship, although she rejected most of the dishes, and ate very sparingly of the others, this abstinence seemed to arise from loss of appetite, rather than from any particular distaste of what was offered her. When they rose from the table, the earl, who had glanced rather narrowly at his wife several times during the course of the meal, asked her quietly if she was feeling quite the thing. She said hurriedly, Yes, oh, yes, a little tired, but nothing to signify. Letty, interposing in a helpful spirit, said that they were both of them quite fagged with balls and routs, and when Cardross suggested that they should remain at home instead of going to Drury Lane, she at once lent her support to the scheme, reminding Nell that there had been no play put on for months that had been worth seeing. For her part, she said, she would as lief stay at home and enjoy a comfortable cose. But as Nell was well aware that her comfortable cose would speedily develop into an extremely uncomfortable altercation with her brother, she said that she wanted very much to see the play. Cardross at once bowed his acquiescence, but gone was the gentler note in his voice when he replied with civil indifference, As you wish, my love. The play was neither better nor worse than any other that had been performed at Drury Lane that year, and even Letty, who was young enough to think herself hardly used if brought away from a theatre before the final curtain, greeted with approval Cardross's suggestion that they should not stay to see the farce. London was passing through a dramatic doldrums, and with the exception of an occasional appearance of Mrs. Siddons in charity performances, and the promise of a new melodrama by Charles Kemble to be produced at the end of the month under the intriguing title of The Brazen Bust, there was really nothing in prospect to lure the most inveterate playgoer into any of the theatres. The Haymarket Theatre being closed, owing to the preoccupation of the management in the Court of Chancery, 
the Surrey on the south bank of the river devoting itself to burlettes that were not at all the thing for ladies, the Regency fast sinking into decay, and both the Lyceum and the Olympic staging displays that resembled Astley's circuses, lovers of the drama were obliged either to stay at home or to attend a succession of indifferent plays put on at Drury Lane or at the Sands Parade. I can't think what made you wish so particularly to see such a stupid piece, said Letty frankly, when Cardross, having conveyed his ladies back to Grosvenor Square, had gone off to spend an hour or two at White's Club. I did my best to save you from it, too, for I could see you were not in spirits. I didn't wish to see it, replied Nell, rather wearily. I said so only because I was in such dread that you would begin to tease Giles about your marriage and I thought that anything would be better than that. How can you be so nonsensical, demanded Letty, quite astonished. Why should you care if I did tease him? He would not blame you for that. No, very likely he would not, until you had dragged me into the quarrel, which you would have if I know you. And in any event, I can't bear to be obliged to listen to you driving Cardross into losing his temper which no one can wonder it is doing, for you must own, Letty, that as soon as you are cross, you express yourself in the most improper way to him. Pooh! Why shouldn't I say what I choose to him? said Letty scornfully. He is not my father, after all. I don't wish to distress you, Nell, but I warn you I mean to speak to him tomorrow morning before he goes out, and what's more, I shall continue to press the matter every time I see him until he yields, which I don't doubt he will, because I have frequently observed that gentlemen dislike excessively to be continually teased, and will do almost anything only to win peace again. Upon hearing this pleasing programme, Nell expressed the fervent hope that Providence might see fit to strike her down with influenza during the night, so that she would be obliged to keep her room for several days, and went off to bed, a prey to what her sister-in-law was uncivil enough to call the Blue Devils. There was no intervention by Providence, but Nell very prudently put in no appearance at the breakfast table. Since it was Sunday, and she liked to breakfast before attending morning service, this was served earlier than on weekdays, early enough to afford Letty ample time to launch her preliminary skirmish. That she had availed herself of the opportunity, Nell soon knew. She was seated before her dressing table, while Sutton arranged her shining ringlets in a fashionable mode known as the Sappho. When Letty erupted into the room, out of breath from having rushed upstairs in pelting haste, and with her eyes and cheeks blazing, yeah. she uttered explosively. Well aware that she would not be deterred from pouring forth the tale of her wrongs by Sutton's presence, Nell at once dismissed her stately dresser. She would probably learn the whole from Martha presently, since that devoted and uncritical Abigail was deeply in her mistress's confidence. But that couldn't be helped, and at least Nell would be spared the embarrassment of her presence while Letty gave rein to her first fury of indignation. Hardly had the door closed behind Miss Sutton than the storm broke. Pacing about the room in a fine rage, Letty favoured her sister-in-law with a graphic and embittered account of what had taken place in the breakfast parlour. The preliminary skirmish had clearly developed rapidly into a full-scale attack. Equally clearly, Letty had been beaten at all points. Her recital was freely interspersed with animadversions on Cardross's character, cruel, callous, tyrannical and odious, being the mildest epithets she used to describe it. After one quite unavailing attempt to check her, Nell resigned herself, listening with half an ear to the various measures, most of them happily impossible, Letty was prepared to resort to if Cardross should persist in his uncompromising attitude, and wondering whether either of them would be in time for morning service. Not surprisingly, Considering the overwrought state of her nerves, Letty's diatribe ended in a flood of tears, violent enough 
to make Nell entertain serious fears that she was about to fly into a hysterical fit. This danger was averted by a mixture of heart's horn and common sense, and the sufferer from fraternal persecution presently subsided into milder weeping. Nell had just succeeded in soothing her and was bathing her temples with hungry water when Cardross, after the curtest of knocks on the door, walked into the room. At sight of Letty, languishing upon the sofa, he stopped short on the threshold and said cuttingly, "'An affecting spectacle.' "'Oh, Giles, pray hush,' begged Nell. The stricken maiden on the sofa bounced up and in a husky voice of loathing promised to go into strong convulsions if Cardross did not instantly leave the room. "'By all means do so if you have a fancy to be well slapped,' retorted Cardross, looking as though it would give him considerable satisfaction to carry out his threat. "'If you have not, stop enacting Cheltenham tragedies and go to your own room.' "'Do you imagine,' gasped Letty, "'that you can order me to my room as though I were a child?' 